Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamp, Regis Ruguru Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Molina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Kosmo. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 273 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. It's the first episode of 2021. I'm joined by, we're kicking off the year uh, doing things big. I'm joined by the former heavyweight world title challenger. Eddie, you're back with me, man. Another year. Yes, <laughs> yes sir. Yes, sir. How are you? And we are we going to go. Sh- I'm, I'm good, my man. We're going to be. Uh... We're gonna go strong in 2021. Absolutely, we're, we're, we're gonna, be, yeah, we're gonna be pushing. We're gonna be pushing for a lot, <laughs> a lot. Absolutely, absolutely. Like I say, we're gonna we're gonna start with the review part of the show. Then we're gonna welcome our our sole guest, which will be the former IBF super middleweight world champion, Mr. Caleb Truax, as he prepares to take on Caleb Plant at the end of the month for the. Uh, for, for the IBF super middleweight world title. Truax trying to win back his belt and Plant trying to land a big fight, perhaps with Canelo at some point in this year. Um, anyway, we'll be speaking to him uh, very very shortly after the review part. Then after that, we're going to sign out the show with Eddie's Lockdown Knockdown. That's how we're kicking off 2021. Oh yes, I think it's been um, quite a while. I think it was back in October the last time we did it and it was... Um, you know, it was about the the Vladimir Klitschko fight, the the world title opportunity where you had to travel to Europe, and uh, yeah, this is the first fight back from that, so we're going to get into that in due course. But anyway, the review part, we're going to start here on New Year's Eve, um, Thursday, the thirty first of December. Um, we're going to go out to Tokyo, Japan. One fight to mention over there: K- Kazuto Ioka, um, twenty six and two now. TKO for him in his fight against Kosi Tanaka. Um, it was, you know, it was it was really a hardcore type of fight, I guess, for the hardcores. But um, yeah, he managed to get the win there, Ioka, and I think it's quite impressive, really, because Tanaka is a very exciting fighter, um, a young a young guy still as well, only twenty five, but a, a TKO there in the eighth round for Ioka. Um, you know, definitely, I, I feel like. Uh, you know, his experience showed there for sure. Um, yeah, that was it for that one there. Um, the other fights to mention, let's just go straight into it, I guess. Um, at the American Airlines Center in Dallas, Texas, USA. This one was on Saturday the 2nd of January. Um, I'm going to start with the undercard, I think. Yeah, let's start with the undercard. Um Felix Alvarado, he defended successfully his IBF World Light Flyweight title against DJ Creel of South Africa. Creel was down in the second and fourth round, and he was out. He was TKO'd in the tenth. Um, brave effort from Creel. Now 16-2 and two with a draw. Um, Felix Alvarado, man, relentless pressure. Very exciting fighter. Now 36-2. and two. Um Creel is a guy who, you know, is, is 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 quite a cool guy to be honest with you because he was the IBF minimum weight world champion and um, he I think had the opportunity to defend his world title for I don't know how many thousand uh, dollars or whatever he's he's, he's from uh, South Africa like I say he was offered you know some money for defending his minimum weight world title but then he was he was offered even more money to to move up in weight and box for the light flyweight world title so he did that basically and um, yeah he came up short unfortunately uh, also on the card his um, Alvarado's uh, Felix Alvarado's brother Rene Alvarado um, huge upset in my eyes man you never really know what you're going to get with Rene Alvarado 
Machado, but he was down twice in the third round and once in the 12th and final round, and he lost a very, very, very close decision over 12 to Roger Gutierrez. Roger Gutierrez, the the Venezuelan fighter, now 25 and three with a draw. Um, Rene Alvarado there loses his WBA Super Featherweight World Title, and like I say, it's a it's a big upset for me because he only lost it on. Uh, on on the scorecards by one point on all three judges scorecards so bear in mind he was down three times in the fight he still only lost by one point so it was a very close one despite the knockdowns uh all three judges had it exactly the same um yeah you know unbelievable for Roger Gutierrez who really um has kind of come out of come out of nowhere off the back of that if you like you know he he had a couple of back-to-back losses back in 2018 one to to uh, Hector Tanahara a young prospect still undefeated and he actually had a loss himself to Ran, uh, Rene Alvarado Rene Alvarado took his O back in 2017 but here he was uh, three or four years later uh, getting his getting his revenge and now he's world champion so that's amazing for him but the main event the main talking point for the interim WBC lightweight world title Ryan Garcia 21 and 0 now a TKO for him against our man Luke Campbell who is now 20 and 4 a TKO in the 7th round for Garcia but he was down himself in that in that second round um I'm I'm not going to break it down first Eddie I'm going to give you the pleasure of that what did you make of young Ryan Garcia's performance against the old veteran uh, Luke Campbell who perhaps might have just missed the boat, really, in terms of his pro career. I think I think he's about thirty three, something like that. Now I don't think it's going to happen for him, unfortunately. Yeah, that's one of those things. It's hard uh, at that age, even though it's <laughs> that's really not old. But even at that age, especially in the lower weight classes, to you know get that title shot as it go. I mean, to get that title, you know, late on, um, it's a little bit harder because um, you don't get faster, obviously, as you get older. You don't your 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 skills and things continue to sharpen and you continue to learn, but the reflexes doesn't don't don't get better as you get older. So uh, it's kind of hard to hope to be able to compete. But I will say that he I kind of I feel like I underestimated what he was capable of when I seen him in there. I was like, damn, he could fight. Like he is clearly uh, 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 beyond what I thought. I thought he was a good fighter and be a good test for Garcia. But um, regardless of whether I the right thing to happen that he was going to stop him mid to late or whatever. I, I still feel like he, he was, he, man, look, one or two things happen differently. You know, maybe he doesn't get caught with that great shot that he got caught with and, and, and get, you know, the, the, maybe as they go further into the fight, maybe he gets back into the fight where maybe Garcia gets a little tired because he was throwing heavy shots constantly throughout the fight. So it could have happened, but um, Luke Campbell showed a lot. He showed me a whole hell of a lot. And it's a shame that he's come around at this point where, I mean, you got Tank, you got freaking, uh, well, it's uh, Tiafimo Lopez, you got even, you got uh, Lomachenko coming from down there, then you got Ryan Garcia, you got Devin Haney. There's a lot of real serious talent that's around the area, so it's kind of rough on him. And to think that he would, I mean, it's great because if you can beat those guys, then you're obviously the man, but. And when you're just right on the cusp of being, you know, one of the greats, it's kind of tough, man. He, so he's in a rough spot. But um, throughout the fight, man, I mean, look, he was really testing Garcia. Like, I mean, he wasn't he wasn't in there messing around. And, and the shots he was throwing, smart, smart shots. He was setting them up nice with a straight right hand to the – straight left hand, I'm sorry, to the body. And then coming over the top with the with the straight right, I mean, with the straight left. But then he even, he even curled it. He even threw the hook in left. You know what I'm saying? And caught him perfectly. I mean, and and it wasn't no flash knockdown, to be quite honest. It wasn't one of those knockdowns where the guy goes down like, damn, I got caught with some stupid shot. And I'm, you know, he was actually like, oh, like his arm got caught behind him. Like it was a legitimate, uh, serious knockdown. Like he was, he could have been in real trouble. You know what I mean? But credit to Garcia, he got up and 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 actually finished finished okay. You know what I mean? He didn't look he didn't look terrible, but you can see that Luke Campbell was still like even as the fight was going on, I felt like Garcia was winning the rounds and he was showing his speed and his and and, and, and the explosive power that he had. 
But I feel like Luke Campbell was right there. He was, you know, he was just certain little things was happening. I like he kept going back to that shot, that hook and right, and caught him a couple more times with it. And it was just like, and even through some like some of the some some of the straight right straight left hands to the body that were landing nice too. I mean, he was doing really really well. You know what I mean? His jab to, uh, on the uh, southpaw side was looking really, really good at times. Just in general, I mean, just the whole thing. You know what I mean? It, he he really, really gave Garcia the test that he needed, I think, to um, to now say that he's of the elite class. Like, I mean, it was all you know, it was questionable early. I mean, beforehand because obviously he didn't have the uh, resume that a lot of the other guys who were elite have. You know, but. Uh, now with having a guy like Luke Campbell on his record and him actually showing up and actually being the kind of test that he needed, man, it was great. It was great. It was a great night of fighting. I, I mean, well, well, for the main event in, in any way, uh, I didn't get a chance to see much of the rest of it, to be honest. But um, man, it 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 was good. It was a it was a nice night. That body shot, though. Oh my gosh, the shot that he caught caught Luke Campbell with, man. It was. It just like I could see, like you know, most people were like, oh. He, he gave up. He bottled it. He didn't do. He didn't get up. He didn't listen with those kind of shots. If he could have got up, he would have got up because he was he was trying to win that fight. That body shot was just perfect, well timed, and right at the point. And you could see that he put his hands up. It was kind of like a, a, it's a cardinal sin in boxing. Put your hands up high to block a shot to the head. You're supposed to you're supposed to bend and, and take it on the glove, you know. And man, he caught him perfect right there, and he just dropped him right to his knees. He couldn't even get up. He went from one knee to two, and to his hands on the ground, and it was over. But it was a, uh, it was awesome fight. Uh, credit to Ryan Garcia. I hope to see these big fights now with him included. Uh, it is one thirty five pound division, man. I, I, I want to see it take off. Yeah, brilliant assessment, by the way, Eddie. I, I really like everything you said there. But um, yeah, very impressive, highly impressive from young Ryan Garcia, becoming the first man to stop Luke Campbell. And yeah, you're right, the finishing shot where he kind of did what you know his gym mate does, Canelo, where he looks like he's going to throw a left hook upstairs and then he switches the uh, the, uh, the the direction of it in a split second. Um, but yeah, the first round for me was was an exciting round. Garcia obviously was on the front foot for the whole round for me. Uh, Luke seemed to be kind of happy to sit in that counter-punching stance. Garcia, for me, won the round. He looked very, very sharp. Uh, he showed good variety in his shots. Uh, Campbell did land a nice short right hand um, through... Uh, I think towards the end um, on the inside. Um, second round, obviously, as you touched on, down went Garcia. And um, amazingly, he didn't look overly hurt for me. I mean, Luke jabbed no. jabbed him to the body, like you said, Eddie, and then came upstairs with that huge left hook. And when I saw the replay at the end of the round, it, it actually looked like a much better shot than I initially thought it was. And mm. um, Garcia was probably winning the round in all, in all fairness. But yeah, perhaps he got yeah. a little bit overconfident and he got... And he got hurt, but he showed some great powers of recovery. Frilling stuff through the first two. Round three, Garcia really um, really upped the pressure in the third. Great response from being on the canvas. Luke still had success with the jab to the body and the left hook over the top, but... Um, or sorry, the yeah, the left hook over the top, but his success was was few and far between. Round four, Garcia was looking so much flashier um, again, you know, really showing that confidence, really putting it on Luke Campbell. Campbell started to invest in the body again with the one-two, um, sometimes both both shots even to the body, but he wasn't winning rounds. But still, I, I didn't think he was he was. Uh, you know, taking too much out of himself. I quite liked um, what, what Luke was doing. It was it was smart at that point. Round five, more of the same from Garcia. Um, he was starting to smother Luke Campbell. Uh, Luke Campbell got caught as well with a temple shot, a left hook from Garcia. And to be honest with you, Luke Campbell looked gone. It was the last punch of the round there in the fifth. And... Um, yeah, he had his back. He had his back turned. He was on the ropes. Possibly the ropes even held him up. And one more shot, by the way, I think he'd have been out of there um, asleep. You know, he was he was in real trouble there. Um, I hoped that the minute between the rounds would be enough for him to recover. Round six, Garcia came out all guns blazing straight away, seeing if Luke hadn't fully recovered. But I think he quickly learned that Luke wasn't ready to go just yet, and he calmed his attack down. He won the round though, Garcia. And then of course the seventh and final round. A round I thought. 
Campbell was winning. And then towards the end of that round, Garcia ripped in that big left hook into the right side of Campbell's ribs, mm-hmm. right on the sweet spot. Uh, Campbell, as you said, put his guard up as it landed, so it was perfectly timed right underneath the elbow. And um, yeah, Campbell took took a knee and stayed down. I'm not going to, you know, as you said, it's, if he if he could have got up, he would have. There's no quit there. Uh, no questions of quitting mm. for me. Uh, he was grimacing, and it's a brilliant win for Garcia. Um, more impressive than Lomachenko's win over uh, Campbell or Linares' win over Campbell, and he's answered the gut check question as well. He's got heart, this kid. He got up, and he won, and I was just thoroughly impressed. And um, off the back of that, a lot of people are saying that they fancy him over Devin Haney if that were to happen. And to be honest with you, I can understand why you'd say that now. It is... Um, yeah. it, it, that's going to be a I mean <laughs> the lightweight division is on fire man but I'm just repeating things you said it was brilliant but um, that's it yeah. though for the review part there is a couple of pieces to new, uh, pieces of news to mention but before we get into that I'm going to tell you this Eddie um, I um, decided to I, I found a place today and they, I, I've forgotten what their what their actual name is called it's a food place um they're not sponsoring us, but <laughs> but I went and got some food oh, from them. Say. Yeah, no, no, no. And they're called something like the Brooklyn style pizza something. I don't know. Brooklyn style pizza crew. I think okay. they are. The Brooklyn pizza crew. Something like that. It's a place in um, in Fulham in London, not too far from where I am. And, um, and yeah, it's like, you know, New York style pizza. So I was thinking, okay, let me, let me see what this is about. Oh my lord god. I mean, how I know that the the pizza slices out there are humongous, but how um what? how many inches is like a regular pizza out there, do you know? Like a regular size pizza like what well, like I said that all, that all really depends, but normally it's what like I think it depends on the pizza, the size of pizza cuz like you get a large one, some people have like you know like what eight, 10 or 8, you know, about 10 inch or so. You know what I mean? Depending on is depend it all depends on the size of the pizza. Yeah. Like I said, for a large, a normal large would be like ten or so. Yeah. And a small, like a medium slice would be about eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think an eight inch cut, you know what I mean? Something like that. So what what, what were they what were they popping off with over there? Okay, so <laughs> I'm interested in that. So I'm I'm the same as that, you know, like a like a they kind of say like a personal really small piece of pizza would be about seven inch. Then there'd be an eight inch or a nine inch for a medium. Then a large would be about a 10 to 12 inch. And I think one right. time I had maybe a 15 or 16 inch pizza. Anyway, this one, right. 20 inch pizza. Whoa, what the hell? <laughs> I swear, 20 inches. It was like I was taking a, a television back in my car. It was, it was huge, man. And, um, I you couldn't meet you. It all. I've had, uh, I've still got it here behind me. I, I, um, I didn't even eat half of it, and that was it. Like that's my, <laughs> that's my full day. Yeah. I didn't have any breakfast today. Yeah. No lunch. No, no dinner or anything like that. That was all I've eaten, and I couldn't even eat half of that pizza. It was unbelievable. Um, that's that's what I'm saying. With that with that kind of thing, with those kind of things, you can't eat breakfast or lunch you can only eat dinner with that, cause that or or eat that for every meal you know what i mean yeah so that's my yeah uh, that's my that's my food for tomorrow as well sorted out i think but anyway um yeah uh, you know they're okay they're okay they're okay um just yeah, yeah just it reminded me a little it sounds bit sounds like it's okay joe no you know it reminded me a little bit of new york the pizza out there but um that they, they've yeah. managed to kind of get it right when you because there's nothing like that over here, man. You get a slice of pizza over here, you can easily pick it up with one hand. But these slices right. here, it's like you need, you need like two hands, man. <laughs> it's huge, you know. Two hands and help. It's like <laughs> damn. Well, you know what? What I see when I get, because there's a place over here. It's called the Spiros. Or I can't, you know, I can't remember. But it's a good pizza restaurant I used to go to since I was a kid. Well, you know, for a long time. I mean, obviously, I haven't done it now in a while, but. Um, and they have reasonably big, big slices. And what they do is they'll, like, if you order them by the slice, you know what I mean? Then you're ordering, like, a pretty big slice. Like, there's even a place around the corner from where I live. Uh, it's called Angelo's. If you go there, they have pretty big slices, like, you know, maybe 12 to, what, 14 inch or so. You know what I mean? I, it's something like that. But um, there's certain places that specialize and do things purposely that are a little outrageous. 
just so they can, you know what I mean? It's a selling point. And if it's good on top of that, then yeah. You know, so I'm pretty sure if you like the pizza, if it was if it tastes great, then you know what I mean? It I guess it served a purpose. <laughs> you know what I mean? Breakfast, lunch, and dinner for you. Yeah. I mean, um while we're on the topic of pizza, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm going to put it out there that Uno is not that good, Eddie. You don't like it? I don't think it's too good. Well, I put it, I'll put it to you like this. It, I, think, I, feel like, I feel like if it depends on what you get in these places. Like for me, I, you know, I, I didn't, honestly didn't think it was that great the first time I had it. But it was also what I got. And then when I actually went and got like a, spe- a specific piece, I can't remember what it was. I actually liked it. You know what I mean? But like those places, you have to get and find something that you like on the menu, and then you know go from there. But I mean, if you, you know, I mean, I don't blame you for saying what you're saying about Uno. I mean, it's, nah. You know what I'm saying? It, I guess it could be met depending on who you are, and depending on what you order. You know what I'm saying? What I ordered, I really liked. Okay. You know what I mean? But. You know, but that was it. So I can't say that you're wrong about that at all. Okay. Well, anyways, moving on from the pizza, the pizza talk, um, <laughs> back onto the boxing. Um, yeah, let's go to the news now. One fight has been announced, top rank of announced for February 20th, um, a world title fight between Miguel Burchell. He's defending his super featherweight world title against former featherweight world champion Oscar Valdez. I mean, boy, oh boy, oh boy. Uh, Most people would favor uh, Miguel Burchell to win that one, but Oscar Valdez only knows one way to fight, and it's called being hit while hitting. So um, he doesn't hit and not get hit. He hits and gets hit. So it's going to be an action-packed fight, you'd imagine, there. Um, his his defense is, um, you know, he blocks punches with his with his face. Um, over here in the UK, we've hit some bad times because um, there was a lot of, uh, like, spikes in reported, um, you know, coronavirus cases and stuff like that around about the new year because... Some people decided to still have parties and stuff like that. Um, And yeah, you know, the the amount of cases has spiked up. So off the back of that, the British Boxing Board of Control decided to suspend all fights that were scheduled for January. Now, there wasn't too much actually scheduled for January. So initially, everyone was thinking, okay, what does that really mean? You know, when's the next big fight night anyway? Well, January the 30th, we were supposed to be getting Josh Kelly against David Avenesian. Obviously, that one's off, and it's a big shame because they've been trying to get that fight on for well over a year. It's about the third or fourth time that the fight has fallen through, including the first time ever when it actually fell through on the day of the fight. So it just seems like this fight is not supposed to happen. But um, they're they're saying they're going to reschedule it, match room, but of course, no date just yet. Um, And... MTK, they had to cancel one of their events as well. Lee McGregor was set to take on Kareem Gwerfi. Um That one, again, will be rescheduled at some point. I think it's going to be for the European title, I believe. So, uh, yeah, bad news for the UK. And no real update on what's going to be happening in February just yet. Because, you know, they're saying... Because um, this announcement from the British Boxing Board of Control, they um, said no boxing and all that. And that was before the you know the prime minister came out and said that there's going to be a real strict lockdown again just like the, the the one that they enforced in march when it was really really uh the worst lockdown of them all where it was very serious and um you know at the minute over here Eddie you can only leave your house for about i think 1 hour exercise a day and only you know only go out for real uh, genuine essential journeys so um you know, the British Boxing Board of Control, before they even made this announcement, already suspended events for for, for, for um, January. Then the next day, the PM, the Prime Minister, came out, made this announcement that everything's going to be in lockdown until about mid-February. And um, I, I hope I'm wrong, but I can see the British Boxing Board of Control coming out again and trying to look good again in the eyes of the government and saying, actually, we're, we're going to suspend events for um, February 2, which is a real shame because 
I don't think it's public knowledge yet, but there's two world title events supposed to be taking place in the UK. Um, you know that that they can't give dates for at the minute until they know what's happening, and it involves fighters on both um, those fights. It involves fighters from overseas, so yeah, it's very it's a very uh, tricky situation, especially for the guys overseas um, coming over here. I don't know how it's going to work, but hopefully we get to see, you know, we get to see boxing back on because at the minute all we have is international fights and uh, sometimes it's it's a nightmare staying up till really late unless the zone do what they did on the weekend with um, with Campbell and Garcia, which was really nice. Thank God for that. Um, anyway, that's it for the news. Um, yeah, the final thing to do now before we wrap up part one is to welcome our sole guest which as i said is the former ibf super middleweight world champion mr caleb truax after that we will have the lockdown knockdown segment returning for the first time since october but like i say here is our sole guest Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the former IBF super middleweight world champion. It is, of course, Mr. Caleb Truax. Caleb, welcome back on the show, my friend, and Happy New Year, of course. Happy New Year, man. Thanks for having me back, man. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure from my end also. So, Caleb, we last did an interview in January of 2019, so two years ago now. It was just before the the fight against Peter Quillin, which obviously ended in a no contest. You were cut. Um, How long did that that cut take to fully heal, Caleb, by the way? Uh, it, uh, it was a pretty bad cut. I think I had 18 stitches total, uh, 14 on the exterior, 4 on the interior. Uh, but the doctor did a great job stitching it up, and you can barely even tell I had a cut uh, right now. But uh, it, didn't, it didn't take too long to, uh, to heal. Uh, but the problem was my, my, Achilles was, uh, <laughs> my Achilles was messed up, so that took about almost nine months to heal. So... I couldn't really do much boxing in that nine months, and, and uh, that was plenty of time for the cut to heal up properly. And of course, you only had the one fight since then. It was it was in January of 2020, so again, a year ago now, uh, against a guy who I kind of struggled to pronounce his surname. But you picked up the win that night. Uh, he's a tough guy. It was it was by majority decision. It went the distance. Tell us about that fight for those in the UK that didn't get to see it, Caleb. Yeah, it was kind of a, a get-back fight for me. I, had, I was... Uh, like you said before, I, I had the two rounds against Quillen, and and uh, that was it for for 2019. And uh, I fought. His name's David Bassa something. I, <laughs> I can't pronounce his name either. But uh, it was good to get back in the ring and test my Achilles out. It was the first time fighting after having uh, suffered the torn Achilles, and. Uh, I had to shake off a lot of rust and didn't have my greatest performance, but uh, got the win and and uh, got out of there and and uh, proved to myself that my Achilles was healthy and and uh, gave me confidence going forward. And again, as we say, you know, you only had the one fight in 2020 in January. Did you have any scheduled fights collapse due to coronavirus at all? Uh, I was I was looking to fight in May. Uh, it was uh, it was going to be an IBF eliminator. It wasn't scheduled yet, but uh, they were they were uh, pretty much set on having me fight in May, and and obviously that was uh, scrapped uh, due to due to COVID. And I was supposed to fight uh, Alfredo Angulo in in August, and uh, unfortunately I had to withdraw from that fight. And uh, so I've had a I've had a uh, sketchy uh, couple of years, man. It's been tough. I'm, I'm chomping at the bit to get back in the ring and, and punch somebody. And again, when we last spoke, funnily enough, at that time I mentioned the possible Caleb versus Caleb fight. It's finally happening uh, here in 2021. The fight set for the 30th of this month in LA. Uh, what should fans expect to see from you, Caleb, for those that haven't seen you in a while, like you said? Uh, like I said before, I'm hungry, man. I'm, I'm chopped to get back in the ring and, and prove that I still belong in the upper echelon of the, uh, the super middleweight division. And I want my title back. Uh, he, he Plant has the IBF title that I that I won over uh, in the UK from from the Gale, and and I want to be a two time champion. I want it back, and he's the man that's that's standing in my way. So I'm gonna do everything I can to get that belt back and and go out there and get the win. Yeah, and as you mentioned, and as you know, I was uh, I was I was it was a pleasure to be ringside when you came over here and beat the Gale. Um, what are your thoughts on Caleb Plant as a champion? Because there's been some times in his career where 
some people would say he hasn't looked that impressive, but then there's been other times he's looked really good. And with all that said, I, f- I still kind of think he's probably the most unproven of the champions or the recent former champions, because I'd say, in my opinion, Billy Joe Saunders, David Benavidez, Callum Smith, and obviously Canelo, for me, have got better resumes than, than Caleb Plant. Uh, yeah, you know, he, he's got he's got really good boxing skill. He's got really good speed, uh, footwork balance. Uh, he's got a good jab, and he's got the tools. But like you said, he hasn't really fought anyone. He he's fought um, uh, uh, Jose Uzcateki, uh and won the belt from him, and that was a good win. You know, Jose Uzcateki is a, is a good puncher, and and uh, he had some good wins on his resume, so that was a good win in, in winning the title. But since then, he's fought two guys that were kind of layups, and and uh, doesn't really have that great of a resume. And I believe I'm the the best fighter that that he will have faced, and uh, I'm playing on giving him his toughest challenge and, and his first loss. And I want to ask you as well, I'm sure you watched it, what did you make of Callum Smith versus Canelo? Some boxing fans now think that Smith is trash now, um, but what did you what did you make of it? Uh, you know what, man? Uh, Canelo is, is, is a really, really good fighter, and uh, Callum Smith is a really, really good fighter. He, he's, he's, he's a huge super middleweight. He's a good puncher. And Canelo completely negated everything that he brings to the table, and and it was a it was a fantastic performance by Canelo. Uh, I give Callum Smith credit because he took a beating for for 12 rounds and and uh, hung in there. He could have he could have uh, uh, you know cashed out and got that got his check and got out of town, but uh, he 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 had some um, uh, strength to to last the 12 rounds and. And I give him credit for that, but uh, yeah, I think it was more about Canelo than than Callum Smith. And and uh, I've I've seen Smith fight, you know, three or four or five times, and he's a good fighter. He, I saw him beat George Groves, which was a very impressive win. Uh, he 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 didn't look very good against uh, I forgot what the guy's name was. It was in the Super Six series before he before he fought Holes George Groves. He, he didn't boxer. look great. Yeah, yeah, the kickboxer. He didn't look great against him, and I thought. John Ryder probably deserved to, to to beat him when he when he fought John Ryder, mm. but um, he's a he's a he was the top dog in the super middleweight division. Uh, you know he's a Ring Magazine champion. Uh, uh, I think he was the WBC champion as well. Or no, uh, excuse me, the uh, uh, WBA champion, and he was the top dog. And Canelo made him look silly. You know, I think it was more about Canelo than it was about Calum Smith. Yeah, it certainly was. And I'm asking uh, this one because I'm, I'm guessing you probably saw this as well. Um, did you happen to see the uh, the little, well, they, they say he's an Instagram boxer, but after the weekend just gone, I don't think he is anymore. Brilliant win for Ryan Garcia. What'd you make of him, man? Uh, I thought that was a fantastic win for him. Uh, you know, he, he like you said, he's, he's kind of been labeled a uh, uh, flash in the pan Instagram boxer and, and, I kind of fell victim to that uh, thinking earlier on and his last couple wins, you know, I was like, Oh man, maybe this kid can actually fight. He's more than just a, a pretty boy and a, and a IG model type dude. And when, when the fight was scheduled with Luke Campbell, I, I was like, man, congrats to both these guys for making the fight happen. That's a tough fight for both of them. And the way that fight played out, I don't think could have, couldn't have went any better for, for Ryan Garcia to prove some of his naysayers uh, wrong because he got dropped. Luke Campbell's a, a hell of a, a fighter. Uh, uh, he's been in there with Lomachenko and, and some other awesome guys, and and he dropped him hard in the second round. And Garcia got up and and weathered the storm and and uh, uh, proved to everybody that he's a legit fighter and and he's going to be a force to to reckon with at, at 135. I think. Yeah, it's very exciting to see what happens next for him. And obviously the aim for you, Caleb, is to beat Caleb Plant and regain your old belt, like you said. What would be your next move? I don't want you to look too far ahead, but I'm guessing he's probably got a rematch clause in there, to be honest with you. But what's the plan? Uh, yeah, the, the plan is just to uh, focus 100% on on this next fight coming up January 30th and get the win and, and see what happens after that. You know, he uh, he's going to want his rematch obviously but uh um we'll see uh how everything plays out and it's a division that uh now that Canelo's committed to the 168 division it, it uh obviously there's a lot more appeal to to owning a belt in that division because Canelo's uh, 
the money man in the sport and, and everybody wants his, the, a shot at, at, uh, at him. So um, just have to see how this plays out. And, and I don't want to make uh, the mistake of looking past uh, um, Caleb Plant to focus on somebody else. I think you know, he's probably, <laughs> he's probably making that mistake from some of the interviews that I've, that I've seen and some of the uh, uh, comments about him fighting Canelo next. And uh, I've seen that happen before, you know, James DeGale made that mistake against me the first time around. And, and uh, he was talking about everybody, but me, uh, even at the press conference, you know, a couple of days before the fight. So that's a mistake that I'll never make as a fighter. Brilliant words, man. And um, I want to ask you this as well. Obviously, lockdown has been, you know, the, the pandemic has been very challenging for everyone. You have always said it whenever we speak. You, you've you got quite an interest in life outside of, of, of the ring. Have you still been able to fish and brew beer and stuff like that? <laughs> Absolutely, man. I uh, I was just saying this in a I was just saying in this in the interview the other day that uh, I'd be lying if I if I said the the pandemic was was super hard on me because you know I got to spend a lot more time with my family. I got to uh, stay outside, uh, did a lot of gardening, did a lot of fishing, uh, just just hanging out outside, man. So uh, there's a lot of people that that lost their jobs, couldn't couldn't make their money, lost their businesses, and and uh, I don't want to take away from from any of their struggles by saying it was hard on me because it wasn't, man. I'm, I'm fortunate and, and, uh, got to, got to spend a lot of time with my kids and just, just, uh, do some things that I enjoy doing, uh, all the while, you know, being able to, uh, do what I love as far as boxing goes and working out, you know, we, we had closures with gyms and, and, and couldn't, uh, do the, the normal workouts that I normally do, but I was, I'm always staying busy and, and do my road work and chopping wood and, and getting to the gym when I could. So, uh, it wasn't uh, it wasn't too bad for me, man. And just finally, Caleb, if you've got any closing words, mainly for your UK supporters, obviously you know when you came over here, you were adored. You were somewhat of a bit of a cult hero for a while in those fights with with, with James <laughs> DeGal. Uh, what's your message to your supporters from this this side of the water, my friend? <laughs> uh, man, I I, uh, I still appreciate everybody over there that's following me. Uh, I'm ho- hoping to get back over to the UK uh, to to get a fight in before my career is said and done and. And uh, you guys are awesome, great boxing fans. Uh, I love uh, love the energy that you guys brought to the to the arena, and and are still back to the arena with some of the big fights. Oh, you guys can't have too many fans in the in the arena, but uh, hoping to uh, hoping uh, to get back over there and fight. And uh, my beer actually just uh, eight count uh, IPA just just uh, hit the hit the UK shore. So I've been seeing a couple of people tweet me. Uh, uh, that uh, they've been drinking my beer over there in, in the UK, so that's uh, that's cool to see. But I uh, love you guys, and uh, you guys are the best boxing fans in the world, and uh, we appreciate you over here in the United States, that's for sure. And there we have you, eight count IPA. That's that's something I've got to get my hands on over here for sure. But listen, Caleb, it's always a pleasure <laughs> speaking with you, my friend. Best of luck for the 30th, and I hope that we can catch up sometime after. All right, thanks, brother. Appreciate you, man. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. The news part we did already, the review part we did already, there's nothing to preview whatsoever, so that is uh, that, that that won't be happening. And that's it. It leads us perfectly into the lockdown, knockdown, Eddie. Um, we're going to go here, of course, to the fight after the Vladimir Klitschko defeat for the world titles in, in Germany. Um, right after that, because that fight obviously took place on... Uh, on on the 20th of March 2010, you were back in the ring 11 months later against Derek Rossi, a man who you'd previously stopped in seven rounds. However, this time he was able to go the distance over 12. Um, Where will we be starting here? Well, we'll start in the aftermath of the the whole Vladimir Klitschko fight situation. (laughs) Okay, (laughs) so let me just jump in and say... There's that famous interview that you did in the locker room after um, the the Klitschko defeat, where you've got sunglasses on. Do you remember it? Yeah, yeah, I do. I do. And as one of the, as hey, listen, I'm gonna tell you real quick. Hey, I'm gonna let you finish what you want to say, but um, I had that was like you know minutes after I walked into the you know the locker room. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I had literally just regained my memory as I was walking down the stairs of the ring. So. That was fresh. My brain was fresh right then. <laughs> it was, I'm just letting you know. Like I had literally just started remembering 
what was going on. You know what I mean? Like I remember walking down the steps and they didn't walk in, but I don't remember anything that happened in the ring previous to me coming down the steps. So that it, it was, it was just a crazy experience, but go ahead, go ahead, Joe. No. So you've got those sunglasses on and um, you're just devastated. Like as, as yeah. our listeners probably know, you come across so bubbly and happy and positive and you really are that way. Obviously I've been around you, you know, for long enough. You're, you're such a like, uh, you're, you're the kind of guy I could call up and say, oh man, I'm having a bad day, this, 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 this. And even if you're having a bad day, you're, you're not, you know, you, I don't know, man, you're, you're, you're just positive. You wouldn't be like, well, man, I can't really hear this right now. Cause I've got this, this, and this going on. You're, you know, you're, you're great yeah. like that, man. So to see you yeah. so devastated, so just like, I don't know, man. So negative, I, I suppose is the word, yeah. is so kind of yeah. uncomfortable seeing you of all people like that. Yeah. And it's it's sad. I, I showed um, a clip of it to, you know, to my girlfriend and she was like, she couldn't watch it. She was all getting like uh, almost emotional, man. It's uh, it's tough to watch. Yeah, it's bad. It was like, I, just, I don't even remember what I was saying. I just remember, you know, I remember talking, you know what I mean? I remember I remember going to the uh, press conference, too, after. Um, and it was just like, ugh. You know what I mean? It was just like a constant memory. And let me tell you, when I... Well, I mean, are we starting? I just want to let you know. Because this is part of the whole thing. Just to let you know. Yeah. Joe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm listening. Oh. oh, I'm saying, like, are we starting now? You want me to start? Yeah, just go straight into it, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. But, well, anyway afterwards the whole process like with the interview like we were just talking about like um i remember like i remember talking I remember i don't really remember the questions i just remember talking and just being completely like wow man this is like almost like life was over you know what i'm saying like i've never felt that kind of disappointment before like i've been disappointed i mean obviously when you're a kid and you don't get the christmas gift you want you know, oh, you know it sucks but not this kind of disappointment. It is like where you put everything into it and it just didn't work out. It's just hard to, it's hard to be happy about anything after something like that. You know what I mean? So, you know, I go into the press conference and everything and I do the press conference and it's the same kind of thing. Like I really don't feel any positivity from this whole thing. You know what I mean? Even though they say, Oh, you did this, you went 11 rounds. You did, you did, you, you made him have to work for it. You know, he couldn't hit you like this. He got all that stuff is great. But with me coming out on the on the bad end, not only on the on the on the losing end, but being stopped for the first time, being on the ground for the first time and out was like I could have never have dreamed of that. And the disappointment from that on top of the loss, it was just like, man. So, you know, I go from there. Now I had actually had to go to the hospital. And I didn't have to go to the hospital, to be honest. If I didn't go to the hospital, it would have been fine. But I went to the hospital, you know, because of uh my um she was the cut woman she did the cuts for me she said look i i don't trust you know being that you lost conscious consciousness consciousness like that no matter what the situation is i feel like you should go to the hospital and be checked so i said hey you know what all right and i thought it was just gonna be maybe a I think hour you, or so i think you said this on the back of the klitschko one to be honest with you this rings a, a, oh, a I bell oh, yeah. i might have i might i might have yeah all right well, i don't want to revisit it but anyway that happened so, and maybe some of this is going to be, but it'll be, it's okay if it's repetitive, whatever, we'll just keep going to it. But anyway, I just remember being in the hospital for two days. I only thought it was going to be a few hours. Turns out it was two days and it was almost like a blur. Those two days, it didn't really seem long at all. And they really, like, I think, I, I think we talked about it, but I, they said I had issues with my heart, not so much with my head. So it was, it was almost like they didn't even, you know, they didn't even uh, think, you know, anything was wrong in my head. They were more concerned about my uh, irregular heartbeat. So anyway, once I left there, I remember, you know, we were supposed to actually have two. We had actually two days or I think two or three days left over that we were supposed to be, you know, partying and enjoying ourselves and all all of that. Obviously, we expected to win and it just didn't happen. So uh, we just had two days to basically sit there and just go over the crap that happened well, for me, it wasn't two days, above three days. It was two days in the damn, in the hospital and then one day out. But um, I didn't even get to see some of the friends, some of the people I was supposed to see after. It just, it was just kind of like a whole, whole nightmare. So I get back home. Now, granted, this is the most money I've had in 
my entire life at one time. Um, and you know, I'm not like a person that goes and spends money recklessly. So, but I did, you know, I went out and got a couple things. I ate what I wanted. I'm, you know, I didn't buy a flashy and a new flashy car. I already had a decent car anyway. So I didn't have to, I didn't go and buy another car or anything, buy a crazy house or anything. But, um, I, I just, you know, I, I tried to enjoy myself as much as I could, but I found that most of the time I was just in the house, you know, in the apartment and just, just, I couldn't smile it like I quite, like I used to do. And like when things were good, um, I wasn't, uh, it, it was like, I lost to, um, Povetkin first and it was like, oh man, that was, that was a horrible thing, but I didn't get stopped. You know what I mean? I was beating them early and I could have, I could have won the fight if I would have just done some things, you know what I mean? But this time it was like, I was beaten, like. I lost this and there was no chance of me winning at any point. It felt like, you know, of course everybody got a puncher's chance, but it was just like, it just felt like I was completely out of it and I was beat soundly. Even if that wasn't a hundred percent true, I was beat and I knew I lost and it just felt so, so uncomfortable and, and just, I was just so unhappy. Like we could be laughing about something completely unrelated to boxing. And I just, I would laugh for a little bit, but then it would come to the thought process of, I mean, the whole thought of, of of being in there and losing and not being on top no more, not being one of those guys that they talk about anymore, and it was just like, it was just a, it was it was a terrible, terrible time. Even though I had a lot of good things going on, it was a really, really bad time. And not to mention that I got my head knocked off when it comes to the uh, the payment after as well. Even though I had more money than I ever had, it was still far less than I should have, but, uh, it was just, it was just bad, man. It, it just, it just felt like the world was, 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 was coming down on me and I just didn't have any, any answer for anything. I wasn't happy. And like I said, even though things were better financially, they weren't better in my head, you know? So, and it legitimately took before, cause I didn't even go into a boxing gym to be honest. And you know, Joe, how much I love basketball. So, you know, I was playing a ton of basketball and that was the only time that I forgot about what was happening with the, with the fight. But when I come off the court and get back into my everyday, believe me, it came back, you know, but anyway, um, it wasn't until like maybe I want to say six, seven, maybe eight months after when I, when I started to focus on another fight that they were trying to get for me and they were actually trying to get me into a tournament for another shot at Vladimir. So they say, oh, well, we got an opportunity coming and it's going to be with one of your former foes, Derek Rossi. And I was like, oh, really? And they say it's going to be the, an eliminator tournament, you know, for you to fight maybe Klitschko again if you're able to win this, these fights, which we know you are. And they said, OK, it's between you and Rossi and... There was another, I think it was Tony Thompson in um, Maurice Harris. Something happened and I got, I don't know, I got a crazy idea. I guess I, somebody told me something or said something wrong that the other fight wasn't happening and it was just going to be me and Rossi for the eliminator. So I'm like, great. You know, I, I beat him. I get an opportunity to get back in there and right this wrong that I had. Didn't turn out that way. But um, I'm not going to get that far ahead because we want to talk a little bit about what happened with the fight. But um, getting prepared for the Rossi fight after, you know, going through the whole, you know, depression with after the loss of Vladimir, it wasn't really difficult to train hard. You know what I mean? Because in my mind, I had a certain way to be. Now I'm in a, I'm a championship level fighter. I, I should be training this way. I should be doing these types of things. So I, so I was very disciplined even on my own. And, um, you know, I've been, I've been a while without my dad. I've been Rob has been trained. You know, my my manager has been training me up for a while now. So, we kind of had an idea of what to do and how to get prepared for a fight. And this wasn't what I'd been used to facing in the last few. Obviously, I had two fights, three fights in a row. There were guys that were in the top five in the world. You know what I mean? So I was like, uh, so I had a, you know, I didn't want to have like a a letdown in, in preparation just because I thought maybe I'm fighting somebody that I'm well above and I had beaten them before. So you don't want to get the wrong idea and the wrong attitude toward a fighter, no matter what the situation is. And we had understood that Rossi had gotten better. 
You know what I mean? Because at the time I fought Rossi the first time, he was like a football player turned, bo- turned boxer, right? But he didn't have a whole hell of a lot of experience. He had 15 pro fights, and he had a, I think, I think he had a small amateur background in Fendi, and he, you know, he you could still, there was some immaturity with his style and the way he fought when we fought the first time. This time, he was saying he had got, you know, good rounds of sparring with Tomas Adamic and and different guys, and he felt like he was, he was doing real well with Tomas and sparring. So he had a different level of confidence. So he's I'm a, a rejuvenated guy. Now, of course, all fighters, when they fight a guy a second time, expect and and and, and they want to say, oh, I got I'm out of renewed confidence. I did this and different, and things are going to be so different, dramatically different. Well, in this case, yes. It was going to be dramatically different for him in a sense that he could, he understood more as a fighter now how to deal with a guy who is, a, you know, an elite professional better than he did the first time. The first time he was just, I'm coming for blood. I'm going to try to knock this guy out, not understanding there was a, a, a light year skill gap between us. And he just didn't, oh, he couldn't overcome it with size and strength. You know what I mean? Which he thought he had over me. So this time he felt, okay, I added enough skill along with size and strength that I'm going to be able to overcome this, you know, this guy and, and his, and the skill gap that we had in the past. So my whole thing was just to make him remember how it was to, to get beat by a guy with, you know, skills way above his, but also, you know, being that I had certain expectations of what I was going to do in the, in the, in the, in the ring, my preparation. And I know it's going to sound like kind of crazy, but my preparation failed in a way because I, was preparing really hard. I was getting in shape and all that. I was doing everything I had to do. The sparring, I'm not, I don't, I can't remember every one I had for sparring, but I don't think the sparring was crazy good or up to par necessarily, but it was part of, a part of it was because we honestly didn't have the budget for it, even though I had the money and I'm, I don't want to use the money that I got, you know, in the bank for that. I want to use the money that we're supposed to be getting to assist us. You know what I mean? in a way like you take a certain percentage of that. But, but like I said, once again, this is where the business comes in too, is the fight, even though it was an eliminator, it was off TV on the undercard of, uh, I think a super six fight, if I'm not, mis- I'm not mistaken, I can't remember for sure, but it, there was no budget. So we had to basically do everything on our own and just make deals with friends that we knew through boxing. So sparring was kind of lacking. So what I tried to do was make up for it by conditioning. And once again, we talked about this, you know, in some of my previous fights, I had overdid it. And once again, because now I'm thinking, man, I got to get back to Klitschko level. I got to, I got to show these people that this guy doesn't stand a chance in there with me. I got to dominate him like as, as if I wanted to fight Klitschko next, because that was what the plan was. So my dumb behind training hard, doing everything I'm supposed to do, but we talking about the week of the fight, literally days before a day or two before no a day before the weigh-in i'm in the gym running basically sprinting three miles you know i'm running like, i'm running like six like five forty five six six minute miles the entire time and i end up i think you know most people when they when they um get you know in, prep, in preparation as a heavyweight for uh for a fight i mean you lose a certain amount of weight but you kind of stabilize at a certain point i was still losing weight the week of the fight you know what I mean? Continuing to train hard, running hard. The only thing I wasn't doing the last few days was sparring. But I'm and I and I and I couldn't understand. I just wanted to look good. I wanted to I wanted to be the best I could possibly be and really overshadow this guy and just like kind of make it just like where he doesn't even exist and, and get him out of there in no time. You know what I mean? That's that's what I wanted to do. Okay, but of course, when you over prepare yourself, you're 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 definitely gonna see a serious drop in performance. So what happens is I go and we're, we're getting ready and we are walking in. I kind of felt a little weird the entire day, to be honest. Um, you know, day, the day your fight day for me anyway is a day that I'm not eating a lot. I don't really feel in the mood to eat. And uh, I was just kind of like trying to just keep myself calm and relaxed. But I had a weird feeling, an uneasy feeling, like kind of sluggish. And I'm sitting there saying to myself, man, not one of these fucking things again. You know what I mean? It was just like, ah, oh, man. So I'm thinking, okay, drink water, you know, try to hydrate, drink a little, you know, eat, eat some some food light, do something to give you some energy. 
And I'm thinking maybe it's the jitters, gonna, you know, it's going to work itself out. And I remember being in this hallway where there's like, a, uh, where all of the, the fight people were, and we were about to step into the arena and go to our dressing rooms. And I just felt like, man, this shit's not letting up. You know what I mean? I really just don't feel good today. And I'm just hoping, and I'm like, I'm just hoping as I, you know, I get into there and start wrapping my hands and shadow box, I start to feel a little sharper, a little snappier. And it never came. And I remember being in a hallway and I'm basically cursing myself out and cursing. And I'm just like, what the, f-? like, you know, on the, on the ring wall. And this is on the ring walk. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on, man? Like, why the hell am I feeling like then? I, and I'm pissed off because I can't figure out what's wrong. And I'm and, and my brother knows and we be talking about it. And I say, he's like, yo, man, just calm down, man. You're fine, man. Get in there. Yo, just walk him down. Walk him down if you don't feel, if you don't feel like just walk him down. You know he can't fuck with you, man. Just walk him down. And I'm sitting there like, all right, man. I, you know, I'm just going to try it. I'll probably feel a little better when I get in the ring. Didn't feel better when I got in the ring. I felt worse than I did the first time. And the first time I had the flu, you understand what I'm saying? The first time me and Rossi fought, I had the flu. And the first few minutes of that fight, I felt like, damn, man. Cause I just felt bad. But as I started to sweat out, you know, like when you're cold, when you got a, a bit of a cold or, you know, flu or whatever, you, the, the more you do and you start to sweat it out, things start to, you start to feel a little bit better. And that's what happened in the first fight with this fight. It just felt like nothing. Like I had no snap. I had no, 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 nothing, no energy. It just was, it was just like, uh, and I got in the ring and I'm like, man, I got to fight, fight a guy with this feeling like this, possibly 12 rounds. I'm like, man, I got to get this guy out of here. And I remember the first round I could barely throw any real punches, man. It was just like, like you wouldn't have known by looking at it, but there was no, there was no movement. There was no, there was no hop in my step. I don't, if you watch, you could tell, but it was just, it was just very blah. Everything that I felt like I threw, he was actually like working his, you know, working, you know, out, not out boxing me, but he was definitely boxing and he was moving. You know what I mean? And I was being aggressive. I was walking him down and, you know, because obviously that's what we, that's all I could do. And, you know, we had talked about it a little bit and I was like, damn, man, I got to start feeling better. I got to find a way to find it. You know what I mean? I got to find something. And I remember, going back to the corner and you know, my, my manager, my trainer at the time, come on, man, you got to fight this guy. You, you got, you know what you got to do. You, this guy ain't supposed to be in the ring with you, man. You supposed to, you know, and he's trying to motivate me and it just, it just wasn't happening. And I remember him and Steve told me after the fight, he was like, man, that you had them over there sweating bullets. I mean, it was dropping bricks, man. They, they couldn't, they, they couldn't understand. Like they was looking at me and asking me like, man, when is this guy going to start fighting? And, you know, when I was in there, I was thinking to myself, like, I got to do something. I got to do something. So what happened was over the course of the first two or three rounds, I would say he got two out of the first three rounds, maybe more. Maybe he even got the third, which I know sounds bad. Uh, At least that's how I felt. I don't know if that was 100% true. You know, I can't remember. I got to watch it back. But by the end of the third round, I could see him starting to weaken. And the reason was I was still, I was still hitting him. I was still landing shots to the body. I was constantly pressuring. And, and if you don't notice, if you've never fought before, or you've never competed at that kind of a level in boxing or in any kind of combat sport or boxing in, in particular, when you see a guy pressuring you and you, for whatever reason, can't do anything to keep him off you, it feels like a wall is closing in on you. You know, it's slowly closing in. And no matter how much you push it back, it's going to keep coming. So if you were, you you can do whatever you want. You can run and, and, and jump into it, and the wall is just going to keep on coming. And that's what he started to see. And that's why his, his performance started to drop real fast. At first, he was looking all right. He was kind of sharp at times, throwing good shots. By the th- end of the third round, he didn't see a return on, on his investment on his boxing that he was doing. And all he saw was me to continue to pressure him. Then I started to feel a tiny bit better. I started rocking off shots and counter right hand in them and, and throwing little shots at the body, double jab and right hand in them and stuff like that, keeping him on the, on, on the defensive. And, and by the fourth and fifth round, he had basically was leaning, basically was sliding down the ropes, you know, going from post to post, just trying to find a place to rest. You know what I'm saying? Because it was just pressure and pressure 
and pressure. He couldn't figure out how to get out of it. And I thought, as in those rounds, I started to realize, okay, this is how I'm going to get him. And then I figured it was only a matter of time before I stopped him. Then, and if I'm not mistaken, the fifth or the sixth round, I, he had threw some, like somewhat of a lazy jab and caught nothing but air, and I rocked off it. Hit him with a counter right hand, dropped him easy. Boom. Went straight down. At this point, I'm like relieved. I'm like, cool. Because I'm about to get this guy out of there. <laughs> and I ain't got to go the rest of these, these rounds feeling like crap. And he went down. He went down good. It was a good shot. It was something like he was kind of shocked. Oh, shit. And he got up. But, but he got, see, this is where the experience for him came in. He got up. And he held a little bit. He, he moved a little bit. He wasn't, he wasn't, you know, like going all over the place, but he figured out a way to survive. And me, I wasn't, I wasn't feeling my best, obviously, because if I would have been feeling even half of myself, I'd have thought I got him out of there. But the reality of it is I didn't have it. Even when I was sick, I did I, I had more energy than I had then. You know what I mean? So he figured it out. And this is the experience. And this is, this is what is, this is what happens when you, you fought numerous times, you faced adversity at different points get better at dealing with them even when you know there's no chance of you winning which he realized after that knockdown and just in general in the fight he still figured out a way i'm not going to get stopped tonight so that was his mission and i mean i caught him with some good shots i had him and i had him going at different times in the fight different rounds but he he survived he did what he had to do he pity patted his way to to a decision loss but that goes to say also how what, what kind of I was saying about myself, like even there was a there was a post fight interview. And I remember the guy coming up to me and I was just like I was so disappointed in myself. Like I was thinking of different guys who were in the heavyweight division. I was like, damn, if I, if I fought them tonight, I would have got beat. Like I would have been, you know what I mean? Like if I fought Vladimir, I think I mentioned David Hay. I think even Tarver at that point was, I think, heavyweight or something. And I was like, man, I'll probably get beat by all of these dudes. That was just what was in my head because I had wanted to be so much better, especially in, in with the loss to Vladimir. Like you have to improve. There's no way that I'm going to be able to beat elites having a hard time with Derrick Ross. No disrespect to him, but I also didn't realize what percentage of myself was in the fight, and it was probably. And I'm not. I'm not. I'm not capping. I'm not. You know. I'm not. I'm not lying at the in any way about this. But it was probably 10% of what I actually have or had at that time in the tank that I was actually using in that fight. 10%, maybe 20. And and I was still able to win, but it was like, man, it just felt like I, I, I was I was in a bad spot, man. And it didn't help that I just came out of that depression from Vladimir, you know what I'm saying, to, to come and have a performance that I felt was bad and then to get almost no money for it. It was just like, man, insult to injury all over again. You know what I mean? So it was it was it was a rough, rough year. You know, twenty was it twenty twenty ten. You know what I mean? Obviously started off well with a bang with you know, fighting getting an opportunity to fight for the title and all, but you know, with the loss and then at the end and then going into twenty I mean, and then going to um on into two thousand eleven and the first fight I have back from the loss was uh was a fight that I definitely felt like I could have been so much better with. It just, it just didn't, it didn't work. It just wasn't really, really, a, it wasn't a good situation. I just wasn't happy with boxing or myself at that time. And I just, I don't know, you know, I just, I needed something to get me back into, you know, the good graces of boxing and to have that, uh, I don't know, that the, the, the rejuvenated energy and, in, in, in my, um, to see, the light at the end of the tunnel, which I just didn't have at the time. You know what I mean? And, you know, I guess fighters go through it. You know, some of the greatest fighters have gone through it, but I mean, I don't know if, I don't know if that was the point that the turning point in my career, which then it just kind of went downhill after, because I feel like I still had great performances and great boxing left, you know, uh, after that, but it just, you know, it just never got back to where I really wanted it to be. And obviously, it's an interesting point that we're on now because you know you you come off that Vladimir fight, you you go the distance with Rossi, um, which obviously was eleven months out of the ring as well. We we should add, and then um, 
next time, I guess, we'll be covering the, the Thomas Adamek fight, which I know is another painful one uh, in more ways than yeah. one for you. Um, well, yeah, and and well, where yeah. is the point where you meet your now wife? Is it after the Rossi fight or is it after the Adamek fight? It was after the Rossi fight, before the Adamek fight. Okay. She, she actually, I actually met her, and don't laugh. <laughs> via via internet. We don't need to go into that. Date. We don't need to go into that. No, 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 no. But I'm gonna say it. The reason why I'm gonna say it is because a lot of people, you know, they, they look at that and ah, man, that's that's bad. And it, it is most of the time. But you can't. You never know who you're gonna meet. You know, in any situation. So if you kind of just say, oh man, I ain't doing that. That's for losers. Or that's that. It never works. And it's like, yo, you try it. You never know what might happen. I met my wife on there. It's the way it is. But anyway, it was right before. It was right before the. It was literally right before the Tomas fight. Like we had a date scheduled for after I beat. Tom, well, you know, I say I beat. After after that, for one on one, when I beat Tomas. Yeah. I swear to God, it was it was it was for. I think we were probably talk about the end of end of June to maybe even into July, just to be safe. Do you remember? But that was anyway. Do you remember where the date was scheduled for? Yes, sir. I don't even remember the movie we went to see. We had like a dinner and a movie type thing. No bullshit. It was uh, we went to we went to TGI Fridays. Oh, Sounds yeah. like a cheap spot to be. But I mean, I didn't know her at the time, so I'm not. You know, like I'm not going. You ain't putting your hands deep. You're not putting your hands deep in the pockets <laughs> at that point. <laughs> Why would I do that? And it's not even that. It's not so much that. And I'm, I mean, for her too, it's like this is a courting process we just getting to know each other we don't even know what's going on we what the other person has you know going on in their life so um but we went that and then we went to see don't laugh abraham lincoln vampire hunter i swear to god i I've could not even, make this up i've never even heard of that film eddie good good <laughs> but no actually that's not a bad movie though okay. you know I mean? to me it's not but you know you know my taste in movies how i am i like all kind of movies even b movies so whatever but uh it was um yeah we went to go see that she even still has recordings from me, you know, sending messages and shit to her. And I just wish she'd delete them, but whatever. <laughs> okay. Anyway, but yeah, it was it was around that time, so yeah. Well, there we have it, man. It's been 10 years since then. It's, it's going to be 10 years next month uh, since the Damn. since the Rossi fight. So, uh, But anyways, um, yeah, so next time, which I think, to be honest, Eddie, will probably be next week if you're if you're going to do the podcast with me again next week, then that's it. It will be the Thomas Adamek fight, which obviously is, um, well, it's a brilliant fight to watch, um, you know, right. and, and we'll get into it. We'll get yeah. into it. But anyway, that's it. So well, well, next time, Adamek, go on, go on. Yeah, you know what I was going to say? Well, the, the things leading up to Adamek, there was a, actually a couple of interesting turns, but those aren't going to take long to go through. But, you know, so we'll, we'll actually get into the, like you said, it was a brilliant fight, but the camp was brilliant. Everything about that fight, I actually trained at Kronk for that show. Okay. Excuse me, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely get into that next week. There you have it. There's a little spoiler for next week's show. It will be interesting. And, um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great fight. If you haven't seen it, it's, it's there um, in good quality on YouTube if you fancy watching it before next week. So you know what we're talking about, perhaps. You can uh, you can try and do that if you like. But anyway, that's it for all the talking. We've done the uh, the review part. We did the news. We brought in our sole guest, the former IBF super middleweight world champion, Caleb Truax. And there, we've kicked off 2021 with another edition of Eddie's very own segment on this show. That is why he's here. Initially, when I said, okay, let's start doing podcasts together, he said, I'm only doing it if I get my own segment. But <laughs> I'm, I'm playing. I'm playing. <laughs> but I haven't given him too many, uh, too many opportunities to to take center stage and, uh, and and take it away and walk us down memory lane and tell us all about the details behind all these events that uh, that, that of course took place. But um, yeah, it's it's because there's been so much going on. It's been so busy. We haven't had time. But there we go. We've kicked off 2021. With another edition. Next week we'll be back with another edition and we'll see how long it goes on for. And um yeah, it'll be great when we you know, when we start getting to the uh the time when Eddie came over to the UK and uh met a really nice guy from uh from London. Um 
<laughs> yeah. Anyway, I yeah. wonder who that was. I wonder what his name was. <laughs> yeah. I forgot. Yeah, who me was. too. I don't know who Damn. it was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know why? Maybe because you, you forget the people that's closest to you. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I forgot. <laughs> I don't even know where he is right now. <laughs> Hope he's doing well. Hope he's doing well. Anyways. Yeah, me too. Me too. <laughs> Anyways, that's it for this week's show. Um, I'm going to come in with the intro, uh, the outro, not the intro, the outro in just a few seconds. But Eddie, if you want to say the final word, man, thanks again. Thanks for joining me. And um, yeah, starting off 2021 with a bang, like you said earlier. No doubt about it, man. Big things to come in 2021. Hopefully, hopefully some good things for, you know, everyone, you know what I mean? Which would be this whole coronavirus thing kind of coming to a to a screeching halt. That would be the best bit for uh, for everyone. You know what I mean? That's something to focus on. Uh, but uh, as far as boxing, just to continue to take it to the next level. And, of course, for this podcast and other things that we're involved in to, to continue to get better and prosper for the future. That's what we need. That is what we need. Well said, Eddie. Like I say, the outro, I'll, I'll bring the outro in in just a few seconds. Thank you all for listening this far. Okay, and this wraps up episode 273 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Eddie Chambers has been with me for the duration of the show. A massive thank you to our sole guest on this week's podcast, the former IBF super middleweight world champion, Caleb Truax. Best of luck to him for the 30th in his quest to become a two-time world champion. The biggest thanks of all, though, goes out to you, the listeners. Remember to leave us a review on iTunes if you do get the chance. Remember to send in your quiz questions for Eddie. Um, I think he's been getting it a bit too easy for the last few weeks send those quiz questions in doesn't matter how difficult they are but that's about everything from myself try your best to enjoy your weekends people above all stay safe and we shall see you all again next week thanks for listening